and it's 831. So I'm going to go ahead and call a meeting to order. And I'm going to ask Stephanie to call the roll. Yep, uh, Marta Larson. I'm here and I'm uh, participating from uh, Northfield Township, Michigan. Marisa. I'm here and I'm present, or I'm calling from my. Okay. Elizabeth Thompson. Present, calling in from Ypsilanti Township, Michigan. Okay. And Ellen Offen. Present and calling in from Ann Arbor. And Steve is excused for today. And Bennett Stark. Well, uh, present and calling in as well from Ann Arbor. Margaret Reynolds. Present and calling in from Pittsfield Township. And Jason Maschewski. Present, currently calling in from Dexter Township, but we'll be moving throughout the county over the course of the next half an hour. <laughs> and you have a quorum. Um, and we have another person absent, that's Delois. Is she excused? Nope, she's unexcused. Okay. Um, at this time, I see that we have two participants or two attendees or three attendees from the public. Uh, it's time for public participation. Uh, if there's any member of the public that wishes to um, make any statements, please raise your hand and I will call on you. So I see no hands raised. So I assume that means we have no call to the public. Uh, so we don't need to respond. So at this point, it's time for report from the Board of Commissioners and that would be you, Jason. Great, thank you, I uh, appreciate it. Just as a quick note, I do have a meeting um, with uh, a member of my board shortly after 9 a.m. So I have to leave at that point. Um, not a whole lot going on really. Uh, we continue to wait on what county administration is, is putting together for uh, review of the, uh, what will eventually be proposals submitted for the, uh, the $4 million in senior service and program funding. Um, I have um, put in, um, you know, my thoughts that uh, there definitely be representation from uh, this body on the review panel uh, for those RFPs, uh, and I'm hopeful that that will happen. Um, so I would expect that somebody from the county will be in contact with uh, Commission on Aging, hopefully in the near future, as the process gets going. Um, and I don't know if Peter's on the call, if he has anything further than that, but uh, that's kind of my understanding of it at this point. Uh, we're kind of winding down as we're coming into election season, ending the term on the county commission. Uh, there'll be a new county commission starting on January 1st uh, with at least three new members uh, because three of the members are not running again. Uh, they're running for, um, well, one of them was defeated in the primary and two others were, are running for state office, state level office. So um, I would like to add or, it, or maybe raise I should say probably follow up on the idea that was raised uh, oh, it was last meeting or the previous meeting about how the Commission on Aging is constituted. And um, I think there may be an opportunity um, to alter that. Uh, as, as everyone knows right now, it is um, nine, sorry, my cat's <laughs> agitated. Um, there are nine uh, county commission districts and nine people appointed one by each commissioner. And then we have an at large and then a county commissioner that sit me that sits uh, on the commission as well. Um, and I know there's been discussion about maybe in, uh, coming up with some ways to increase the diversity of, of the voices on this commission and um, in some ways to do that. And so I was wanted to just th raise the question this morning um, whether or not there would, was maybe interest from this body in exploring some altered bylaws that maybe make it all at large appointments um, and not appointed by individual commissioners. Uh, and what, any comments or thoughts you have about the size now that we've kind of worked with an 11 member commission on aging for a year and a half now. 
um, and what your thoughts are on the size. And if, if everybody's comfortable with what's there, then we just leave it. But at least I think there's an opportunity to maybe quickly revisit it um, as we're moving into a new term. So kind of wanted to throw that out there. I think Elizabeth has her hand up, so I'll give you the floor. Thanks. Um, uh, I know in other uh, appointed bodies I served on having one or two or three at large positions is helpful because especially if whoever the entity is that's doing the appointing is really committed to looking at diverse representation for those at large appointments. Um, I would hate to see the commission get any bigger than 15 people because I think that could be very unwieldy. I would even more think 12 <laughs> might be better, but I would hate to give up the opportunity for each commissioner to appoint their own person for a couple reasons. One, I'm from I'm Ann Arbor is kind of the, the, the big sibling in in our um, county in terms of numbers and I think because um, they it is so large and a lot of people who are involved in some of the bigger nonprofits have ties to Ann Arbor <clears throat> I'm afraid and I'm not attributing any particular uh, outlook to, to whoever's doing the appointing, but it would be easy for Ann Arbor's voice to be overrepresented. And as I from Ipsy Township uh, represent some of the zip codes that are in the lower end of the economic scale in the county, I really think that particular representation needs to be uh, continued. Also, I think having one commissioner um, a point, a member of this board is useful because that gives a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, my commissioner, Justin Hodge, has just been tremendous about giving his time to listen to issues, discuss issues, argue about issues with me. But I also feel then that he has been able to as an individual member of the board of commissioners for the county really ably represents some of the concerns that we as a group have. And I would hate to lose that one-to-one -one relationship. Thank you. Uh, Bennett, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I don't wanna break uh, the continuity of um, Elizabeth's concern concern, but backing up. So apparently the uh, commission has not acted upon uh, the millage, the senior millage in terms of recommending it. Is that correct? That's correct. The county commission has not voted to put a millage on the ballot. And it was, it's expected to be to receive a report from the county administration uh, in the first half of 2023, and we'll have that that commission will have the opportunity to consider it. Do you have anything you'd like to share with us as to why you think that's the case, uh, if indeed that's appropriate? Uh, yeah, without naming names, I mean, I can just say other commissioners have other priorities. Other commissioners feel that now is not the time to add a new tax. Uh, other commissioners strongly support it and would like to see it. There's just not uh, a, a, a majority consensus it, the way we're sitting right now uh, to get that on the ballot. Okay, and one additional question. I don't understand, has the four, has $4 million for um, senior services uh, been approved or, uh, or not? from the board? The answer to that is 
the answer to that is yes. It was approved through American Rescue Plan Act dollars. It's going through the county administrative process to collect uh, proposals uh, to expend those dollars, which would then be reviewed uh, by a panel, which when I started my comments, I have asked that members, at least one member, if not more members of the commission, I should be part of that review panel. Okay, thank you. Yep. While we're on the subject of reviewing of proposals, I would assume that given recent developments, the county commission has instructed the county administrator to include in the review plans a um, verification that statements made in the request for proposals responses are accurate. Uh, we, we have some uh, pretty strong federal regulations that we have to follow around American Rescue Plan Act dollars. Um, if you're referring to some of the things that have appeared in political campaigns, I would probably wanna have a side discussion because it's a long time and quite frankly, um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. I'm, I'm sure that's true, but I just wanna be sure that that proposals are adequately vetted. How about if we say that? Oh, there are very stringent federal requirements around these dollars. Okay, cool. Um, I'd like to go back to the discussion about um, the, the uh, constitution of the Commission on Aging. Um, I think that there's probably support among the group to to look at the possibility of adding maybe one or two people at large that would represent um, maybe populations that aren't represented once the um, board is preliminarily constituted. Um, but I think we should talk about that as a possibility. I would also, um, oh Mayor, I just forgot my point. Um, oh, I think we've also talked about um, possibility of staggering terms so that the entire Commission on Aging doesn't get re, you know replaced at once. Um, so I think maybe it would be worthwhile adding that to the potential discussion at the next meeting, uh, potential bylaws revisions in those two areas. Um, other people opinion on that? If I could, I would just add that staggering the terms when you've got commissioners appointing the members is a difficult situation because you could potentially have a situation where somebody gets appointed by a commissioner, that commissioner then doesn't run. And if it's staggered, you know, a commissioner who might come on the board um, might want to put somebody else on and you know, you'd have somebody serving that wasn't appointed by the sitting commissioner. So mm -hmm. that, that's one issue that was expressed to me when I was conceiving of, of this body um, previously, that it should be a person that's appointed by the sitting commissioner. I understand that's an issue, yes. Um, okay, uh, Bennett, you still have your hand up. Did you mean to take Oh, no, out? I'm sorry. Um, I'm okay. sorry. Elizabeth? Um, to that excellent point, Jason, maybe as whatever the subcommittee group or people who might draft a bylaws revision proposal for the next meeting, um, perhaps that's something that the issue of continuity could be addressed by some, by the at-large uh, commissioners because um, however they're appointed, they wouldn't again have that direct relationship with a single commissioner. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one solution um, that we could use to get a little bit more diversity on the, on the, uh, on the Commission on Aging. I just know it's, it, yeah, I, I very much want to be, have a more diverse body and mm -hmm. that's nothing against anybody that's a member at this point, but just ha having the different voices be a part of this, is, I think is what we're trying to get to. And uh, it, it's, it's, you can do that when you look at a, an entire body of appointments, when you're looking at appointing nine or 11 or 12 or whatever it is, but when you're going one by one, as we have with nine of the seats, um, I will tell you that it, it's impossible to coordinate that. And you're really just left up to whoever, whatever individual commissioner appoints. And you're left up to whoever is applying, quite frankly. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling getting somebody from my district. The last person I had that was interested of, I've had probably five or six people I've had conversations with now. The last person who's really interested doesn't live in the county. 
and it, that that's not allowed under the way that the the, the resolution was written so um you know that's that's an issue as well yeah well i think maybe we'll refer this back to the officers to come up with some potential drafts or a potential draft of a bylaws revision that would address those two areas and and then we can discuss it maybe at the next meeting if that if that's acceptable with people yeah okay bennett you had something else yeah uh jason um i am wondering whether you see any value in seeking a commissioner who is an obvious stakeholder um, and which would mean self-acknowledged member of the group that we are working on behalf of. And um, in other words, someone who is indeed um, over 60, which is a rather whatever strange age these days, uh, for inclusion, but um, someone who uh, in the 70s uh, and um, receiving services. Um, so that is my question. I think that, you know, I have an advisory council where I work and we are, um, we have those kinds of members on our advisory council and who, who are actually receiving services. I think it would be great to uh, have somebody as part of this body who's actually receiving the services that are being talked about. So, I mean, I would, and I think that would be great. It's a matter of identifying that person and, or people and uh, uh, having them apply and, and, and participate. So, Again, we Thank have you. very limited at-large seats right now. We have one at-large seat. Uh, so it's it's a bit, you know, unless you get a commissioner who's gonna give that appointment to that person. Um, we're, we're a bit strung by numbers, I think at this point. I think it's also important to recognize that no one that serves on a public body is required to acknowledge or to disclose anything about their personal circumstances. So. Uh, we have to be very careful not to ask people that question and not to uh, pressure people to disclose that information unless they choose to choose to do so. Um, Maria, you have your hand, Bennett? Well, I mean, I would just say that there are people who are um, pleased or proud to say they are a member of the group that we, uh, as a commission, are a uh, pledge to support. Now that's not inconsistent with anything you say, but I, um, I think it's important to mention once again, that there are people who are pleased to acknowledge um, that they are members of that community that we are speaking on behalf of. Certainly, but on the other hand, we are not allowed to ask them to disclose or pressure them in any way. So that's entirely voluntary and not something that we should be um, discussing in terms of someone's membership in this group. Um, Marie, you have your hand up and then I see Dina. Yeah, I, uh, I like the idea of having the one-on-one the -on -one district to sitting commissioner, but I also really like adding the additional at-large members for all the reasons Elizabeth and Jason have discussed. Um, Jason, I know you have to leave in a hot second, but if you have um, a, a copy of, of bylaws such that you're, you're recommending, if you could send those to us to, to look at, uh, that would be really helpful as we work to draft something. Yeah, I, I, I do have the, the bylaws in Word. Uh, thanks, thanks to Peter. And uh, I, yeah, I was going to make some slight adjustments based upon the conversation today, if the group was interested. So I can certainly send those along uh, when I get back to my uh, county device and then can do that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Just send that to the officers and we'll uh, use that to compose our draft. Thank you. Well, Jason's saying he'll, he'll compose the draft. I can make a I can make a suggestion yeah. and send it along to you guys to see what you yeah. think, or if you want, you know, make other changes as well. We can 
talk about that. Ultimately, it's got to go back to the county board of commissioners for approval if we make any changes. Right, right. I understand that. That we we have to propose the changes, then they decide whether or not they accept them. I understand that's the process. Yes. Okay, um, Dina. I just had a suggestion. I'm wondering if it would be possible to um, have the the composition be, you know, at, at least 51 percent of um, of the population that this this commission is designed for, which is for older adults and aging, and then the rest of the uh, numbers could still be appointed by the commissioners. So meaning keep the commissioner appointment, uh, but then they could come from a variety of different um, entities. It could be um, additional professionals that are working in this space or um, other people, other stakeholders that are interested in this work, but keeping like the majority still of the stakeholders that this commission is representing. Due to conflict of interest, we probably want to be really careful about professionals in the space. Is that correct? That's something I have been concerned about. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I think the the idea, uh, Dina's idea of the 51%, it kind of mirrors what area agencies on aging have with our advisory councils, where we got to have 51% be age 60 or over, which is the Older Americans Act definition of an older adult. Um, you know, I'm certainly not opposed to it, um, uh, having that requirement. Uh, again, it, it becomes difficult when you got nine individuals appointing nine members and there's no coordination there and it, that's where it becomes difficult. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can try to address that somehow in the bylaws proposed revisions. I don't know. Okay, Bennett, you still have your hand up. Did you mean to take Oh, it? I, you know, I guess I'm just absent-minded and uh, taking up time by not. Okay, uh, the other thing, um, Jason, under the list of report from the Board of Commissioners was county fund mapping update um, and how, where we stand on that. County fund mapping update? We had asked for the county uh, funds expended um, on behalf of seniors to be mapped out so we could see where the funding gaps are. And I uh, believe that's probably a, a precursor to the millage discussion, but uh, I just wondered if you had any report on how that's going. I, I do not. Uh, I do not have an update on it. I had not talked to administration about that topic uh, in the last month. Okay, it will probably be on the agenda for the next meeting, just so you are, you know, aware and have time to prepare for that. Yeah, I will. I would just add that the county we're in our quadrennial budget process right now, and so much of the county resources are are being allocated to forming the budget for for the next four years. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know that I will have additional information when we get to the December meeting, but uh, I will follow up with administration on that and see where we're at. Thank you. Yep. Okay, um, anybody else have anything else for Jason? And Jason, do you have anything left? I do not, thank you. Okay, it looks like we're finished with that discussion. So we're gonna go on to approval of the minutes. Um, before we uh, have a motion, I would like to note that at one point, uh, the minutes referred to the vacant seat in district two um, and actually the vacant seat is in district one. I am representing district two and I am still here. So uh, if we have that, uh, whatever motion we make is gonna have to request that as a uh, revision as we approve the minutes. So do we have a motion? I move approval of the minutes. Oh, I, I second it. And does your approval motion include uh, revising the minutes to indicate that the vacant seat is oh. in district one, not two? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, you, and Bennett, do you agree with that? Yes. Okay, Stephanie, can you make that note? Is there any discussion? No okay, Stephanie, would you call, call the roll, please? Yeah, Mario Larson? Yes. Marie Grass? Yes. Yeah. Elizabeth Thompson? Yes. Ellen Offen? Yes. Bennett Stark? Yes. 
Margaret Reynolds. Yes. And Jason Maschewski. Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Thank you. Um, it's now time on the agenda for subcommittee updates. Uh, the first subcommittee is communications. Do we have a report? No new updates. Okay. And needs assessment? No new updates. ARPA. No new updates, I believe. Okay. And potential millage? No new updates. Bennett, you had your hand up. Is that yeah? On? Well, I'm wondering, although I mean I've attended a couple of meetings of say yes to seniors as a visitor. And I'm wondering whether um, any of the reports or of what they're doing would be appropriate, um, even though I have not communicated them to Marie. Uh, and so formally, there is no report from communicate from the communication subcommittee. Marie, do you want to address that? Um, yeah, how about you and I talk about it before we bring it to the full commission? Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So Bennett, you still have your hand up. Oh, there. Okay. Um, we have uh, several discussion items on our agenda. The first is a presentation from AARP Livable Communities. Uh, is there someone uh, here to represent them? Oh, I see that there is. I just promoted um, her. Um, Karen, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, so would you help me out here? I believe you're muted. All right, hello. Let me figure out why my computer, why I'm not, don't have any video. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. We cannot, however, see you. Right, trying to figure out why. Ah, there we go. There you are. So, would you help me with a correct pronunciation of your last name? Yes, just like it's spelled, Capinteris. That was what I was going to guess. Excellent. <laughs> um, okay, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to make your presentation, and I'm going to um, ask, do you want questions as you go, or do you want questions at the end? Uh, questions as you go is fine. How much time do I have? Um, what did we tell her? I don't know. 30 to 45 minutes. Okay. And um, so I'm gonna turn the floor over to you, Karen, uh, and you can call on people that raise their hand if they have questions for you, and then we'll see how that goes. And then at the end, I'll take the floor back. Okay. Yeah, I just wanna make sure <laughs> you can all see my screen. Whoop. There we go. Can you all see my screen? Yes. yes. All right, and the bad thing is I can't see you now. So uh, just speak up if anybody has a question, don't raise your hand or I can't see you, so. All right, so I appreciate you all inviting me today to talk with you about um, age-friendly communities and the AERP Network of Age-Friendly Communities Program. Um, and age-friendly communities and livable communities are terms that can be used interchangeably. They mean the same thing. Um, Karen, I think you should know that you are not showing the presentation version of your presentation. You're showing the notes version. So you may want to go to full screen as opposed to what you're doing right now. All right. Is more you're, than on the, you're on the first slide, but. Because I'm not seeing the notes version. That's very strange. Are you using two screens by any chance? Yes. You have to, um, in your Zoom, um, I think it's in the Zoom window, you have to swap the presenter view from the display view. I do it wrong every single time I have to present when you have two screens, it's challenging. I don't know how to do that, how do you do that? Let me see if I can. I think when you go to share too, um, did it ask you which screen to share? It does. 
Yeah, and so maybe you selected the. No, it doesn't. It just asked me. It just has the. It just has the uh, choices to of of what program to shoot. Let's see here. Okay, let me see if there's something here. <clears throat> Is there uh, at the top? Do you see something that says view options on your um, Zoom window? No. It's funny because I don't use the notes at all. So the fact that you guys are seeing, what are you seeing right now? Your notes version. And, and the slide. Yeah, we're seeing the slide with the notes. There you go. Whatever you just did worked. We'll just we'll just do this part. <laughs> I don't know why. So, anyways, um, because we only have thirty minutes or so. Um, so, the question people often ask is, why are we talking about uh, liberal committees or age friendly committees? And that's because, <laughs> as a nation, actually globally, we are aging. Um, and 10,000 people turn 65 every day in the United States. And by 2030, one in every five people will be age 65 or older. Um, and that has a huge impact on all kinds of different parts of our lives and of society. Uh, let's skip that one. We're gonna go to this one. So the program and uh, liberal communities the age friendly program committees program is is based around eight domains of life uh, the, the built environment which is considered uh housing transportation outdoor spaces and public buildings so um uh, outdoor spaces tra trails parks that kind of thing the social environment uh is the other half of it which are Community and health health services and supportive services, communication, civic participation and employment, uh, volunteerism, respect and social inclusion, and social participation. And you have to have a solidly built, a good built environment to support being able to carry out the social environment. An example of this is if uh, Marta wanted to volunteer she would need to be able to uh, get uh, be able to get out of her home safely. She would need transportation to get to where she wanted to volunteer. And then she would need to be able to navigate the location where she's volunteering, whether it's outdoors or indoors, uh, safely. If she couldn't do any one of those things, like if transportation, if she was no longer driving, transportation uh, would would fail on her she wouldn't be able to get where she wanted if she had housing that she could not navigate and get uh, into and out of she, that would it, her, her ability to volunteer would would cease so you need to have a good built environment in order to uh, support the social environment so just a little bit about each of the domains and so outdoor spaces and buildings you know think green spaces, parks, that kind of thing, uh, accessible um, uh, seating, uh, accessible buildings with, with elevators, stairs, but also think about parks that have benches with a break in, in a regular uh, interval so that people can, who are, who are older, don't have to walk a mile to get to a spot to sit down. Or for example, pickleball is very popular these days. And we see a lot of communities putting in pickleball courts, but there's no place for someone to sit down to rest after playing a game of pickleball. There's no shade if it's hot out. So things like, considering things like that. Um, the next one, so transportation. So uh, people, most people don't realize that uh, we outlive our ability to drive by seven to 10 years. And those seven to 10 years are not years where people are so frail that they're not able to get out of the house and, and don't want to engage in things. They are, they are, there's all kinds of reasons that people 
stop being able to drive. Sometimes they're taking medications. Sometimes it's a, a seizure disorder. You have a seizure, suddenly you can't drive for six months. Um, all kinds of reasons. Not and many. The reality is that most people at the very end of life, yes, they may be not interested in engaging in uh, in outside life, but the majority of those seven to 10 years, people want to still go out to dinner, visit with family, you know, uh, see their grandkids, all the things that they did before they were not able to drive. So how do you get where you need to go when you need to get there um, if you aren't able to drive? And um, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, a, that's a big hurdle, uh, as is housing. We'll get there in a second. Uh, when I give this to a larger audience, I ask the audience if you are not, you know, if you're coming here, and usually this is in person, or but if you're going to have doc a doctor's appointment tomorrow and you couldn't drive, how could you get there? Think through the steps of how you could get there. And then think through the steps of how you could get there if you're not relying on a family member or friend. Um, I know that in Lansing, where I am, cabs are sparse. You can't get the cab for anything. Um, and older adults tend to be very nervous about the Lyft uh, type, uh, Lyft and Uber type setting. They feel, they feel vulnerable uh, in those types of, of transportation options. Not everybody, but a lot of folks. Housing is another of the built domain. Did you have a question, Marta? Yeah. Um... You, you don't have public transportation on that pole. And I'm just wondering if you would consider adding that for future discussions. Yeah, but you, I can tell you that a lot of older adults, if they're not able to drive, not necessarily, this isn't everybody, but if you're not, if you're at a stage where you're not able to drive, usually well, there's, there are only, seven fixed route or six fixed route bus systems in the state of Michigan. Do you have one? We have in Washtenaw County, both fixed route, fixed route and curb to curb service buses. And I don't know if you know about the AERP pilot uh, ride at 50 plus, which mm -hmm. is, do you know about that? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, excellent. Because most of, we've been trying to get the word out. Um, yeah, we could add that, but the reality is most people don't want to take uh, public transportation as, you know, as they get older. Mm -hmm. um, certainly can add it though. Um, so housing, people um, overwhelmingly, usually about 89% or greater, want to stay in the home they currently live in as they age, if it's, a, if it's at all possible. Obviously, it's important that they're safe when they're there. Uh, and if they're, if they're not safe, then they shouldn't be there. And there often becomes a time when they're not safe, when people are not safe to stay in their own homes. But uh, there are things that people can do to stay in their homes. Um, it's, it, people constantly talk about new housing. We need new housing. The reality is we can't build enough new housing that's affordable, and that's the piece, that's affordable for the people who need it because we're aging quickly. Um, one of the option is to uh, do modifications to homes. So, and people think, oh, modifications, I'm gonna spend hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars. And the reality is there are many things that you can do in your home for not that much money much less than going into an assisted living uh, or a independent living even uh, setting. So uh, one of the things I'd like to tell communities is look at education programs like the ARP Home Fit program that helps people understand the things they can do in the home they currently live in uh, in order to um, be able to stay there safely as they age. But you know, obviously we do need housing stock for all different uh, uh, stages of life and different bank accounts. 
uh, I just, my point to communities is always, don't just look at the, at the senior high rise or the senior housing. One, 89% or 80 or more percent of people don't want to live in that type of housing if they can, if they can avoid it. And most people want to stay in their home if they can. Social participation, we learned during the pandemic how important uh, social participation, being able to connect with other people is. Uh, you know, loneliness, as everyone probably knows, is just as debilitating as a serious chronic health condition. Um, so being able to have affordable, accessible activities um, uh, is, is incredibly important. And when we get to communications, being able to find where those affordable accessible activities are. Respect and social inclusion. So this is, we look at multicultural activities or multi, sorry, no, multi uh, intergenerational activities. Um, the respect piece, um, this, this uh, domain tends to have the least amount of input when we do community conversations, um, but not that it's not important, but it, it tends to have the least amount of input from people. Civic participation, volunteerism, employment, uh, you know, uh, we have hundreds of volunteers at ARP and they asked the question of why does work have to be all or nothing, right? So can't uh, an age friendly community provides ways that people can continue to work, uh, you know, less than a full-time job if they want that. Uh, and it also has, an uh, age friendly community also has ways to volunteer uh, that, that, uh, meet the volunteer where they're at, not uh, so are meaningful to the, to the, the volunteer. And then communication and information. This is one that people uh, don't realize. We used to get how important it is. We used to get our, our uh, information from the newspaper and the newspapers are pretty much gone these days. I know the Lansing State Journal used to have you know, like seven sections, and now it has two, and it's very, very thin. It's primarily an online newspaper now, as many have gone that way. Um, the problem is older adults have um, don't want to get their information that way. Sometimes they don't have computers. Uh, they have trouble navigating their uh, the internet to find the information that they want. Um, I was at, so uh, uh, Royal Oak is part of the age-friendly network. And I was there, we had the uh, city council, I don't have a city council, they have a different form, but um, their commissioners, I think it were, was, were at the launch of the program. And we had, a, there were about 150 people in the audience. And so I said, one of the, we were talking about communications and one of the commissioners said, raise your hand if you have a computer. And a whole bunch of people, you know, probably about 80% of people raised their hand. And then I said, well, the question needs to be, how many use your computer for anything other than email? And probably 80% of the 80% lowered their hands. And then the discussion ensued in that it's just too hard to navigate um, the the internet and they're afraid, they're afraid of being scammed. Um, so all kinds of, of um, reasons that people don't use the internet for getting communication. The biggest thing is that it's hard to navigate. Uh, and then health services and support services in your community. Everyone gets ill at one point and, and needs something that's available, accessible, affordable, and nearby. So. So when I first started doing this, this work uh, in 2012 with AARP around the program, I've been doing little communities work with AARP since 2001. Um, but when we joined the uh, World Health Organization's program uh, as an affiliate to be the, um, the, the organization in the United States that, that was in charge of the program, um, we held a roundtable and we had 
community leaders from all around the state come. And several of them said, we don't want older adults in our community. They're a drain on our assets. Um, so I made it my goal, my mission to show people how adults are an asset to the community. Most of it's preaching to the choir because most people do understand uh, the, the great benefit of having older adults in the community. Um, but so financially, they're the, the uh, financially, they're a huge assets community. They fueled the health boom, vote in the greatest percentages of any other demographic. The little, the little seedling here represents the fact that people over 50 are three times as likely to be entrepreneurs and start new businesses as those who are under 35. And then older adults tend to volunteer in the greatest numbers of any other demographic. So in 2012, we, we uh, became the affiliate with for the United States with the World Health Organization around this program. And in 2013, because I wasn't the only one getting feedback uh, from communities that they didn't understand the benefits of older adults, and AARP commissioned um, were the longevity economy, it wasn't called that, but they, they commissioned a report from Oxford Economics from the uh, University of Oxford in England. Uh, and they titled it the longevity economy. And it is a sum of all economic activity serving the needs of Americans over 50, including the products and services they produce and the further economic activity the spending generates. So there is a multiplier for every time someone spends, say, money in a restaurant, uh, because that money then goes to help the restaurant, you know, can stay open, pay taxes, buy more food from their producers. It helps the, the staff uh, pay their rent, purchase food, go out to the movies, and that kind of thing. Um, it talks about older, the population of older workers and the transformative force that they represent, accounting for um, more uh, than half of the gross domestic product in just 10 years from now. Uh, talks about the impact of the 50 plus population on overall employment and it's supporting uh, in 2018, 88.6 million jobs. I mean, that's, you know, those hospital jobs, those restaurant jobs, those, those, uh, those jobs, mainly like service type things, but all jobs. Um, the 50 plus contribute to significantly to federal, state, and local taxes. Um, and that is expected to quadruple by 2015, or 2050, sorry. Um, it is current in 2018, the 50 plus population contributed $8.3 trillion to the economic activity in the United States. We expect it to quadruple or triple to $28. $2 trillion by 2050. Oops. And societal benefits. I'm going to skip that one because we're 20 minutes away. So this program was developed by the World Health Organization. Uh, it was a pilot program uh, with 35 cities from 22 different countries representing every continent uh, in, the, in the world. Uh, it was developed to be a uh, program for um, large cities, but when they approached AARP to become the affiliate, we said our motto is what we do, we do for all. So we would need to be able to modify this program to be appropriate for small towns and villages, as well as large urban centers and everything rural, everything in between. Um, so they said, okay, which is why it's not called the World Health Organization Age Friendly Cities Program. It is called the AARP Network of Age Friendly Communities uh, because it's a little very it's a little different than the World Health Organization's program. Um, so how does it work? It works. Uh, first step is that someone would uh, someone a leader. Uh, so in your case, you're a county, so uh, the county commission or commissioners would uh, write a letter to AERP asking to be 
admitted to the network. Uh, there's an application program or process, it's an application. And then there's also a resolution that would need to be completed um, and all sent in to me at AARP. Um, there is a review process and then uh, We've only had we've only had two communities not be admitted, um, and that was because they were um, one one community. They just financially were in dire straits and did not. And it just this program doesn't take a lot of money if done in you can you can you can pay you can take cost. It can take a lot of money if you do it in that fashion. It doesn't need to take much money at all. But this community didn't have staff that could handle it, um, that could put in time. And there is there is um, staff, so it would probably in the as a as a uh, county, it would probably be. I don't know who it would be. I don't know how that works exactly, but it would be someone from the county who would be the 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 lead, I guess. So it could be one one of you as commissioner who would do the lead. Um, there are different formats for work for doing the program, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, the first year is all about con, uh, collecting data. So data from potentially a survey. And these surveys can be done in a number of different ways, expensive ways or very inexpensive ways. Um, the, uh, and community conversations. So we have uh, developed facilitator guides around all eight domains. We tend to, we uh, encourage you to do small tabletop eight, eight person, usually a larger event, but break into eight person tabletop discussions with a facilitator. Um, around each domain. And then you take, year two is all about creating a plan. And every step of this, older adults are required to be part of the process. Um, this is not a, um, this is, this is, and we'll talk in a minute, the next slide is all about who needs to be at the table, who needs to be involved. But this is heavily community and organization uh, community organization involvement. Year two is about taking the information you've gotten, forming work groups and creating a plan on, from the information that has been gotten. Uh, year three, four, and five are about implementing, implementing the plan. And then at the end of year five, a report is due on how you did against your plan. And then there is, it's, it's sort of a continuous cycle. Year six is taking a look at the plan that, that you just finished, what still needs to be done, holding some community conversations to update the plan, and then uh, usually about four years of implementation and evaluation plan uh, report at the end of that and a continuous cycle. So who needs to be involved in this? There's a, you know, pretty much everyone. Unlike most planning that is done, this is done, which is, heavily from um, typically city government at the county level. I'm not sure how we, you know, do you have a county level planner? Is that how it works? I don't have any idea. Yes, no? We do not have a county level planning position at this time. Is there typically one? There hasn't been for a number of years. Um, so typically, planning is done very differently than this. This is a this is this is a sort of a planning process through the lens of an older adult, with the idea that if you provide things that are good for the older adult, you're really you're really making things better for the entire every every demographic. So an example that I like to use is. If you time a crosswalk uh, appropriately for an older adult to get across, then you're then everybody's safe getting across, including the mom who has a stroller and you know a, a younger child on a bike that they're going for a walk. 
if you have a, um, a no-step entrance to a house, you've created a no-step entrance to a house from a house of you know, modified things, um, then it, it works for the older adult to get in and out safely. And it also works for you know, that teenager or that 20 something or 30 something that has broken their ankle and has to, in my case, when my 22 year old broke her ankle and was working in Detroit, living in a third floor walk up, she had to move home and uh, work from our couch for six weeks. Uh, so it works for everybody. They get, they can get in and out um, of the house. So across the board, that is pretty, pretty true. Um, so who needs to be involved? Everybody needs to be involved, right? So any, any, any educational institutions, whether there's PTA, PTOs, whatever they're called these days, or they've changed since my kids were in school, um, school, uh, school leadership, community college or college colleges, um, you know, older adults in the community, elected officials, uh, especially at the county level, it'd be great to get your uh, your elected officials involved. Um, if you don't have a planner, obviously the planner can't be uh, involved. For, for the county level you'd want, so if you have a county road commission, they would want, you'd want them to be involved. Any, any parks, if they're county parks, you'd want parks to be involved. First responders, Main Street organizations, if this is more of a, of a city uh, type thing. Um, you know, development uh, organizations, chambers of commerce, uh, all, you know, faith community, every, pretty much, this is a pretty extensive list. Um, and um, so you want, you want to get everybody involved and you want people from different demographics. We're not just talking older adults, but we're talking, you know, those younger adults too, those, those people who have moved in the community and, are, and have uh, younger children who are in school. You want those um, folks who are, you know, 30s and 40s and 50s and not just the 65 plus. Um, there is lots of, lots and lots of resources available. We have our age, we on the ARP website, there's aarp.org slash age friendly that has all kinds of information about the program. Um, it has examples of plans that have that uh, communities and counties uh, across the country are doing. It also has like final five year reports from communities, just, uh, how, how they've done against their plan. Um, it, the, we have uh, also AERP.org slash livable, and this is all kinds of information about uh, all, all different domains. Um, and it talks about uh, later on here, this one, we have the, the Little Communities newsletter, which is an e-newsletter. Fabulous information comes to your inbox uh, weekly and just great information about what's happening across the country uh, in terms of livable communities. All kinds of publications and resources on an enormous amount of, of information. Um, our community challenge grant, uh, which is uh, a grant that we do every year. So every state has at least one awardee. Uh, grants are anywhere from, you know, the average is 10,000, but we have done uh, like $35,000 grants um, in that program. Opens in January, uh, in June, uh, end of May, early June, the winners are announced and pro the, the grantee must be done with their project by November, end of November. We have the Livability Index, which uh, looks at all these different uh, areas of life and scores, um, scores of community, anywhere from the state level, the city level, the county level, down to an address. So. 
All right, that was a lot in about 30 minutes. Anybody have any questions? I actually, before I before that, as you're thinking of your questions, when I talked with a smaller subset of this group before, we talked about the, the idea that um, counties often don't have, don't control many of the things in the domains. Uh, they, they often have road commissions, they sometimes provide water, um, so they, but a lot of things that, that, that you would create a plan around, they don't necessarily uh, control. Not that they don't, you could definitely do this program as a county, um, but my suggestion to the group was that um, we look at uh, convening all of the communities, large and small, uh, within Washtenaw County and try to encourage them to, at the same time, join the AARP Network Page from the Communities Program. And that working together, you can make a much, much greater impact. Um, that is when you see communities, for example, New York was the first to do this a number of years ago. And um, they, they, they brought on community, they were on counties and then brought in all of the communities within the county into the program and have had great success. Karen, if you're finished with your slideshow, can I suggest that you um, stop sharing so we can all, there you go. That way you'll be able to see if people raise their hand. So any, any questions? Okay. Would you like me to call on people as they raise their hand and then you can talk with them? Oh, I see. Elizabeth had a question. I didn't see her hand. Yeah. Um, it sounds like um, it's very uh, comprehensive planning process, but um, when you looked at all the folks who are involved in conversations, uh, it seemed as as you had mentioned it it's different because it's not just focused on the providers of services, but the people who are using services. And I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on how different groups you've worked with have been able to reach out to involve the people using services? So yes, it's, it's really looking at the, the community residents who are using uh, you know, services or roads or you know, whatever it may be, finding out what, what is it that, that they need to be able to stay in the community. So whether it's, um, you know, the sidewalks that are that that are smooth or or time crosswalks or whatever. But are you asking how do you connect with them to get to to reach them? Is that what your question is? That's one of them, and also maybe expanding a little bit on the benefits you see by having that outreach. So how you reach out to them is uh, different in every community. Some communities have a really strong faith-based network that you can reach out to. I mean, it, it it definitely is not something you can just sort of do a cattle call and say, "Hey, come." Uh, it it it's different in every community. Some communities, smaller communities, a little easier. We have we have done flyers on doors uh, to get people to community conversations. Uh, we have worked in some communities with, um, uh, you know, all, we work with, so we had that list of organizations who should be involved. Uh, typically, uh, when I work in a community, we do a community leader kickoff where we explain the program we explain that we want them involved. Most people are interested in being involved in this. Most, most organizations from 
from community are are interested in being involved. But we also we don't just want them involved. We want them to actively talk about the program. We want them to actively um, host a community conversation. So if it's the YMCA, say, we would ask them to invite their people to a community conversation. If it's a faith-based, uh, you know, if it's a, it's a faith organization, we would ask them to host a community conversation. Um, so if we can go to where people already are, if that organization can invite their people, that is one of the best ways to reach people. Um, same thing with when you wanna get input from, uh, you know, the demographic that have children. You go to the elementary schools, right? You, at, you, you work with the elementary schools or the middle schools or the high schools and you have them invite parents to something at the school. Um, so it's a little different in every community, but, um, and, and every community chooses to do it, uh, you know, their own way. Sometimes you put like, for example, um, in Auburn Hills, we put uh, a notice in the water bills, right? That, that was one of the ways that really got people out to community conversations. Does that answer your question or was there more? Yeah. Um, I think that the idea of having every organization you reach out to be encouraged to have a community conversation, then that information comes up um, is a big addition that meets some of the concerns some of our commissioners have expressed about making sure that older adults have their voices heard. And also um, there's been an active, in our county, an active network of providers that Dina has helped facilitate that has given a lot of perspective from uh, the service providers. And this seems like a way of amplifying a chance for service providers to amplify their voices by having the voices of the people they serve uh, involved. Now, and I have one more question since I'm talking. My understanding is no county in Michigan has yet been involved in the process that I know Florida and California, New York to a degree, Ohio, and some other states have had counties involved, but no Michigan County has done it yet. Is that? That is correct. Although I, I um, pre-pandemic Wayne County was about to join the network and then literally early 2020, we, they were filling out the paperwork and then the pandemic happened. You know, and the pandemic brought so many things to a screeching halt. So we are, um, the city of Detroit has made a verbal commitment to join the network. And when they join the network, Wayne County will likely at the same time join. But you guys could, you guys could be the first uh, county, which would be cool. Um, I've also talked with um, Oakland County. Uh, actually, um, there's a couple of communities, uh, Oak Park and Southfield, who you know, they border each other on one side and, and they really want the other communities in their county to get involved. So we'll, we'll be working on that next year too. My, my question is that um, is related to um, our specific county in that we have already done a lot of needs assessment uh, as a part of our work over the last uh, nearly two years now. Um, and so, how, how would this be handled if, if Washtenaw County were to apply to be involved in the Livable Communities Project? But we already have a lot of the needs assessment done. Would we have to do it over again? No. No, you would not. You would be able to utilize those needs assessments. You would have to do community conversations. Uh, that, that The community conversations really bring out what uh, what people's needs and wants are. 
mm -hmm. much more than the surveys. Um, That's been our experience in the Northfield Township area where we did a lot of community conversations about health equity. Yes. Um, you know, we did surveys, but then we re produced the results of the surveys to the community and asked for their comments and input. And we learned a lot more that way. And a lot more really quality information that way. I always tell the community, you know, if you, if you, because some communities come in, you know, all communities have a little different financial abilities. Um, and we've done what I call boots on the ground surveys, where for smaller communities where uh, they have like block clubs or that kind of things, uh, that each block club is responsible for getting, you know, 10 surveys back or something. Uh, because surveys can be expensive to do. And, um, but I think if you already have the information from surveys, you definitely do not need to repeat that. Anybody else have any questions or Elizabeth, you still have your hand up. Do you have a additional? That's a new one prompted by what you said. It, it sounds like the goal is doing trying to build a process within a city or in our case, a county, which you get a, a plan that um, will continue. It's not a one-time proposal, but more of a plan that continues to be a roadmap for looking at services and priorities and funding that the idea is you build a structure that you keep revisiting. Am I understanding you correctly? Correct, yes. Yeah. A lot of, um, uh, does, does a county do a master plan? No, so a lot of communities will work the age from the communities program with their master planning process. Um, and then it's, it's sort of built right in and continues to, to move forward that way. Um, but not all of them do. Uh, I would say I would say about 50% do that. Um, in Washtenaw County, I think uh, the planning process is pretty much delegated to various planning commissions in various communities. So I don't know how many different communities there are in Washtenaw County, but let's just say for the sake of argument that there's at least 15. So I think it's safe to say that there are 15 or more different master plans, depending on which community you're in. <laughs> So I think that would be one of the challenges is finding ways to get all of these different planning commissions to work together to come up with a countywide plan, which right. could be a challenge. Uh, Elizabeth, you had something? Or not Elizabeth, I'm sorry, Margaret. Yeah, um, so, so uh, would it be, if, if there came up a time when we were planning um, for Washtenaw County, a, say we had a strategic plan or something of that sort, and we had that developed, would that be the time to, to connect with um, this program and see if they fit together? Yes, that would be, that would work, definitely. <laughs> great way to, it'd be a great way to do it. I think we'd probably be more likely to have success with that approach than in trying to get all the planning commissions to agree on a countywide yeah. plan. Yeah, I think so too. Because <laughs> every community has their own issues that needs to be addressed. Right. But having having communities involved within the county, you could have your county strategic plan working with the age-friendly plan, but you could also have the communities underneath them so that you know there's there's things that you could communities can work on together or with the county on. So it just make it a much stronger uh, age-friendly county if you have those communities underneath it, within the county. Elizabeth? It just occurred to me that this might be a way of looking at, um, we've talked about developing a, 
a strategic plan to recommend to the county for moving forward on aging issues. Am I correct in understanding what you said that um, the communities who do this are really using it in that way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anything else? I think I'm up. I'm 45 minutes is up. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to be I want to be time with another time for you. Good at keeping track of time. That's awesome. Anybody else have any last words? This, this will not be the last time we discuss this. I'm certain about that. I'm happy to answer any questions at any time. So let me let me know if I can be a resource for you for any anything. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate your presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, we will let you escape now. All right. Bye. So the next thing on our agenda is to look at the rough draft of the annual report. And since Marie is the principal author of that, uh, with input from others, um, I'm going to let her sort of handle this discussion. So Marie, do you want to take over? Sure. Um, one of the things I like about this process is once I show it to everybody, then suddenly all these ideas spark. And um, and even last night and this morning, Elizabeth and Marta had some great ideas that I tried to incorporate. And um, so view this as a living document at this point. I love all the ideas that you guys that you guys have around this. Um, so initially, I started with the same format that we used last time uh, for this progress report, where we have the blue header, date, progress report, we have all of us listed um, in the column here, and then starting with a very similar opening paragraph. In last year's progress report, <clears throat> mainly it was the, the biggest chunk of this narrative piece was on what we wanted to accomplish in 2022. Um, and so what I've done initially is listed out um, those objectives and then have I have initiated ongoing, um, those are the two that I, I chose for this. Um, and then underneath, I have a bullet point that says, you know, what, what the update is or what the accomplishment is. So that was one thing uh, that I was working on. Let me show you some of the other ideas I'm kind of working with. And I would, I would love your feedback on not only the style, but if there's anything else that you want included, um, anything else that you want changed, reflected differently, et cetera, et cetera. So I was playing with um, this second page. Last year, we did a dashboard that had our subcommittees, presentations, and recommendations to the board. It fit nicely on one page. We've been very active this year. It no longer just fits on one page. Um, and uh, so anyways, I started with our purpose. So just putting like that, that mission statement, that, that piece from our bylaws on the beginning of this dashboard to kind of set the tone I was thinking about starting with um, our accomplishments. An idea came in this morning to also include um, accomplishments under the subcommittees. Um, and so that's an idea to noodle on and I'll love feedback on. Uh, I'll jump back to this in a moment. And the other thing that I did, I don't want experience there. So some of the work that we completed was with these presentations, who it was presented by, and then we were talking about, you know, since we really got meatier this year, um, pick choosing takeaways from each of these presentations to include on our report to the Board of Commissioners. So when they look at this document, they see very quickly, oh, this is something that needs attention, or this is an area that's doing really well. Uh, those kinds of takeaways we were talking about um, putting here in, in these spots. Um, that kind of gave me an idea to have a, a aging sector needs section with, this is a, um, 
just a way to show like this is a, a heavier need. This is um, an important need, but not as big as let's say if this is housing, right? Um, so this is an idea that I'm playing with. Um, and I would like, I want feedback on all of it. So let's scoop back up to the top and get your feedback on this initial narrative first, now that we've kind of seen the whole scope of the, the document thus far. Any feedback on the initial narrative? Okay. Um, for actually, the dash, oh, go ahead. Actually, um, if you'd go back up for a minute, under um, countywide strategy for services, do we wanna include that we're considering, uh, suggesting that Washtenaw County join the Age Friendly Community uh, Project? Yeah, we can do that. We haven't made that decision yet, but it's something that we're considering. Um, so maybe, maybe um, heard from AARP's age-friendly communities, and then I'll I'll say something else about that. I think you could put in something like uh, that: Washtenaw County be the first county in Michigan to undertake this process. Um, I think maybe we should say considering recommending that we be the first county in Michigan. I like that. Uh, you know, her, considering recommending. There you go. You have a formatting issue, but I'm sure you can fix that later. We don't need to do that live. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. How about on this second page? Oh, Ellen, I see your hand up. Oh, you're muted. Uh, okay, I wondered um, why the, up, the, up on that page, I think on the top one, if I remember right, I'm sorry. We didn't say re, um, uh, reviewed uh, opportunities for uh, raising money through a senior millet. Um, so I took the, I'm, I'm open to, to your all's thoughts on this, but what I, I did on this part was take our objectives from 2022. Um, and we talked about advocate for allocation from county commissioners to support the aging network, including ARPA funds and other sources um, ongoing and that we've gotten approved the 4 million from ARPA funds. Um, I can put, you know, heard from say yes to seniors uh, to consider recommending Washtenaw County Senior. Millage. What do you think, Ellen? I'm comfortable with that. Thank you. Elizabeth? I would just add it a bit that the Board of Commissioners had asked county administration to come up with a plan for how they might 
administer a county millage were one to be approved in 2023. And I think that that recommendation that the um, Board of Commissioners made to county administration really flowed not only from direct presentations, say yes to seniors made to the commission, but also to from us. So I think that would be legitimate to list as part of that bullet point. So you're recommending that we move this one, this bullet point, or to this section? Well, I'm saying maybe we should add um, I mean, that's part of advocating for allocation of funds is as part of them considering a millage, add a little bit more that captures that the commissioners asked, requested county administration to consider how a millage would be implemented. Yeah. Okay. How a potential senior millage would be implemented. Yes. Good, good. I think we need to check with Jason to make sure that our recollection is accurate on that because I'm I don't recall that they asked that. So I could be not remembering. When I attended the meeting, I believe that that was in the resolution, but that's good to check with Jason because. Yeah. yeah. I thought we asked them. Yeah, that may be the case. We asked the Board of Commissioners about yeah. this. Yeah. But I think they then, as part of their resolution, included that and asked to county administration. But yeah, it's important to get, get it accurate since we're yeah. reporting to the Board of Commissioners. I think the dog agrees with that point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she does. <laughs> well, I think we've probably exceeded the space allocated in this column. So <laughs> Maria on figuring out how to reformat that one. I'm up to the challenge. It's good. It's good. Um, um so some oh sorry go ahead um not the most important thing but will you be updating subcommittee assignments um i mean uh weber is no longer here but was and i am a member of the communication subcommittee um Don't forget your comma after Stark. Um, are there any other updates on the subcommittee? I, 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 is that is this list accurate for each subcommittee? Please look at that and figure out because we folded, didn't we fold a couple, a one, two, a couple of subcommittees together? Yeah, oh, the pan you. pandemic um, sort of, I you know, dissolved. Um, and it, um, yeah, I don't know what to do with it. I'll leave it up to you. Yeah, um, there were two at the beginning of the year that combined to make the needs and gaps subcommittee. And so that's the one that's reflected here. Um, and then pandemic, as I understood, was meeting for a bit at the beginning of the year before yeah. Um, it dissolved, and since right, it was right. meeting this year, I did want to include it on this list. Mm -hmm. 
we could we could make a note that it's since dissolved or just you know kind of let it be like this either or from my perspective i think you should indicate it it no longer exists okay uh, however you want to state it or combined with needs and gaps maybe because it kind of did yeah Is there anyone on a subcommittee that's not, besides Bennett on communications, which we fixed, is there any other person in the group that is on a subcommittee that we didn't capture? Is a, particularly I'm looking at the ARPA, is that a complete list of who's on that? I believe, or who was on it or is, Yeah, so I know Bonnie was leading that when she was still on the commission. Um, and before she left is when it, it was already handed over to the board of commissioners and we haven't needed to convene that committee since she left. So I don't know that we've assigned a different officer to it or that they've they've had any meetings since. So I think this is probably accurate. Okay, I think we're good on subcommittees. On accomplishments, um, I would like to add the fact that um, as chair, I've gone and represented the uh, Commission on Aging to speak to some community groups at this point, um, particularly the um, Washtenaw County uh, group of senior center directors. Um, and uh, and also the Ipsy Senior Center, I was invited to speak there. And then I have um, the one that Bennett did, and I believe Elizabeth, you did one. I have that in my notes. I'll look back at those and include that. Well, it was with Lurie Terrace. Mm -hmm. With Elizabeth, what was the group you spoke to? I, I spoke to the State of Michigan Commission on Services to the Aging, and also to the State Senior Advisory Council. It's Senior Advisory Council. Anybody else uh, that we didn't capture? I was thinking we might highlight as an accomplishment, um, I'm not quite sure how to word it, but the um, interaction we had with the groups who came and presented, um, especially since some of that information is captured on our website, uh, that whole report that uh, Sharon did for the Say Yes to Seniors is on our website. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just looking actually last night at the a slide deck presentation from the uh, about housing that was captured in one of our meetings. I don't know how you would, I mean, yes, we're gonna do the takeaways, but I think you could repeat, or could you, re maybe other people don't agree that highlighting that is an accomplishment as well, or maybe just putting that we've, used our the website as a way mm -hmm. to make the information available maybe that's, that's what good. i'm trying to get at that's good make information available to the public 
I can flesh that out a little bit more too. It's hard to do a draft like this with a whole bunch of people, but I think we're doing a pretty good job. Yeah, I don't mind. You're pretty good at that, Marie. <laughs> Thanks. I do like that uh, aging sector needs and moving those dots along. Mm -hmm. Maybe at our, uh, actually at our next needs subcommittee meeting, we can talk about how we want to format that a little bit yeah. more. Yeah. Be, yeah, we'll do that. I'll come up with some ideas and um, yeah, hear your ideas really on that too. Idea. Um, mm -hmm. It's really hard in a large group like this to come up with a list of needs unless we have something to work from. Yeah, I wanted to look over the document that we put together last year, the need summary document and the say yes to seniors um, service infrastructure um, document um, and use those as the base for this. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe the next step should be that we would ask the, um, um, needs and gaps committee uh, to look at this with, you know, to to move it to the next draft in the hopes that we can get a final draft by our next uh, full commission. Um, yeah, I think I think that it makes the most sense for needs and gaps to focus on on this particular piece. I don't think that we it would make sense for us to focus on the accomplishments of the and the work as a whole mm -hmm. um but perhaps the people who invited the different the different um groups to come and speak to us can find the takeaways from each of the presentations and i don't have ann arbor center for independent living here right now and I also think maybe the communications subcommittee could take a look as well, mm -hmm. reviewing the minutes and presentations and putting those together. Yep. We should get up a, a good bunch of takeaways, I think. Mm -hmm. Great, good, good. Actually, I think maybe the Center for Independent Living and Age-Friendly Washtenaw might be in the same category because they're both talking about how we can make the community friendlier for older adults. So mm -hmm. changing the, the title on the left from Age-Friendly Washtenaw to another word that would include both uh, the Center for Independent Living and AARP Michigan. Sure. Um. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Center for Independent Living, um, I guess unlike any of the other uh, presentations, deals with a consumer-based oriented group. And, I'm one, and I do think that is important enough to cite and or mention. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm thinking one of the takeaways from that presentation should be um, that a, a consumer-centered approach, I'm not really sure how to word it, but to refer to the you know, um, fact that a consumer-centered approach is sort of the, the gold standard. I don't want to use those words, but well, it underscore I mean, should underscore all the 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 planning and recommendations mm -hmm. of this commission. That would be a takeaway from that presentation. Yeah. You want to just you want to just say that one more time, Elizabeth. A consumer-centered approach should inform the planning recommendations of this commission.
or the plan, the recommendations of this commission, get rid of planning. That's a takeaway from that presentation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I know you're going to reformat it and everything. Mm -hmm. I know you're just trying to capture what we said. So I can see that and the AARP Michigan, because basically that's kind of what the AARP Michigan was also saying. Yeah. They were focusing on not just consumers, but providers, but um, that's they're pretty much on the same takeaway. Anybody else have anything? Elizabeth, you still have your hand up or are you? Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Anybody else have anything to add to this? I think we've made a lot of progress here. Marie, are you good? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. You guys gave me a lot to work with. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Great job, so Marie. Thanks. Hopefully we will uh, be ready to adopt this uh, at the next meeting. And I'm going to ask Jason to see if he can get me scheduled to speak to the Board of Commissioners and give this report. I don't know if there will be time before the end of December. If not, it'll have to wait till January. So, and whoever's the chair next. Um, finalized discussion on length of term is the next item on the agenda. Um, I think we already sort of hit on that. Does anybody have anything else to add to it? So as I understand it, the officers are going to draft um, a bylaws revision working with Jason um, to see what we can come up with for the next board meeting. Anything else on that? I have nothing to report from the chair, considering that I was out of the country for more than uh, half of the last month. Uh, I wasn't really doing much of anything for the Commission on Aging at that point. So uh, no news from the chair. Um, do we have any new business? I don't know of any. Well, Marie, uh, remember I did say um, you asked that we talk together um, after the meeting. So I don't know if this discussion is appropriate for now or is it maybe appropriate after the meeting how about we hang on this video for just a few minutes after the meetings adjourn okay yeah, right. after after there are no longer members of the public present i assume is what you mean Cor correct or or commissioners for that matter peter i see that you have your hand up yes uh so uh I don't know if this is technically a new business, but just something I wanted to share with you all. Um, uh, I will be leaving the county at uh, the beginning of December. I'm staying on through oh. the end of the uh, Board of Commissioners term, um, but then I'm moving on to another opportunity. Uh, so just wanted to let you all know, I'll be around for your next meeting as well. Um, and we'll make sure everything is updated so that when there's a gap in, in official staff support, I know Stephanie will still be around, but um, We'll make sure that uh, everything will be as up to date as possible so that in the new year, when there's someone new uh, assigned to this committee, they have everything they need uh, to keep everything up to date. Well, I have to say, seriously, oh. Miss Peter. Oh, yeah, you're a shining star, Peter. Oh, I, I appreciate that. Um, Best of luck, Peter. Best of luck. Thank you. And I'll still be around. Um, and I, I, uh, Come a month, I, I may be looking at what are open boards and committees looking like across the county. Maybe I can apply for some of it. Maybe not the Commission on Aging, uh, since I know you all have a couple applicants from my district for next year, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll look around and be involved in other ways. Or um, getting more members at large, potentially, Peter. So just keep that in mind. Um, I, I do, since you brought it up, do you know what the progress is on appointing the new Commission on Aging? Uh, yes, so I do know that uh, uh, applications closed last week. Um, uh, we have uh, 
uh, more applicants than seats. So the next step is uh, commissioners will review their individual applications. I reached out to them all uh, in the last day or so being like, hey, here are the people who have applied for each of the seats. Um, let me know if you need more information on this. Uh, they will make their recommendation to the current chair of the board, Sue Shink, who will then make her uh, recommendations for amendments or for appointments at the December 7th meeting. Um, so I believe the way the calendar shakes out, uh, your first meeting in December is the second, um, which means that appointments won't be made by then, uh, but a packet will be published later that day with the list of appointments. Um, so uh, December 7th is the day that uh, appointments will officially be made, though. And would you think that we would try to get our report into that at December 7th meeting, or is it already too packed? So we are pretty packed for the end of the year. It, uh, we have a couple other boards and commissions who are also unable to present their report uh, this year. Um, so uh, we would probably look at, at early January, um, early next year for, for a retrospective look at, at this year. Okay, so that'll be up to the next chair then. Okay, so I see Ellen and then I see Elizabeth. Well, I was just going to thank Peter. He was very patient with me and he was very supportive of this group. And so it, you are somebody I'm going to remember and talk about nicely behind your back. Um, but one other thing, Peter, I need to talk to you today. I will try to call you. It's a Bye. administrative thing, okay? Sounds good, thank you. But thank you. Hey, Elizabeth. I'd like to move that um, the commission communicate in writing to the appropriate person in county administration our appreciation of all the work that Peter has done for us and thank him. I second that motion. Would you like to, uh, and under discussion, would you like to draft that motion uh, in more detail, Elizabeth? Or that, um, that letter, I should say, maybe we could. I'd be happy to, to draft a letter that we can um, formal, do we need to formally approve it as a group at our December meeting? Um, or can the officers, just send it based on the spirit of the recommendation. You could amend your motion to state that you would like to direct the officers to prepare. I would like, to, I move, I amend my motion. I, I move that we direct the officers to prepare a written communication to county administration, thanking Peter for all his, uh, efforts on behalf of the commission. And Marie, do you support I that? Second. I support it. Okay, does anybody have any other discussion? I would just like to say, I appreciate that for two reasons. One, it's very nice, thank you. And two, I'm very impressed at how far y'all have come in making motions. I remember the first couple of meetings where I was just like giving y'all the words and now y'all have figured it out for yourself. So uh, <laughs> clearly I, I did a decent job with that. So uh, great job. <laughs> Okay, uh, with that, um, is, is there any further discussion? Stephanie, would you call the roll? Definitely. Uh, Mara Larson? Yes. Marie Grest? Yes. Elizabeth Thompson? Yes. Ellen Offen? Yes. Uh, Bennett Stark? Yes. Margaret Reynolds? Yes. And I see Jason has left. Uh, your motion passes. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, the next meeting is on December 2nd at 8.30 in the morning. We will hopefully finalize the annual report. Uh, we will have a bylaws discussion. Is there anything else that's on the agenda that I'm not remembering? Are we going to consider um, any further action about AARP livable communities? Yeah. So we'll um, have a um, hopefully adopt whatever recommendation the officers can draft that would go to the county commission about that. So I've added that to the agenda. Anything else? 
Okay, then I guess we've reclaimed nine minutes of our own time here. Um, Woohoo. Um, I guess we're all going to sign off. Bennett and Marie are going to remain. Uh, the recording can end. And um, we need a motion to adjourn. We need a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you. So move. Support. So yeah. it was moved by who? Support it. Who, who was Margie, the Margie moved it. Yeah. Okay. And then who was the first support? There were several. I think Alan. Alan. Okay, so we can vote by waving our hands, shouting yes, jumping up and down, putting our thumbs up or whatever else we want to do. Um, so with that, the meeting is adjourned. Um, and uh, once everyone has noticeably dropped off, then Marie and Bennett can have their conversation. <laughs>